This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 799, recorded on August 31st, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's 79 Fahrenheit, 26 Celsius, uh, partly cloudy, mostly sunny, really. Here it's 28C, which is 82F, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's cloudy. But it's really humid. It feels nice out. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. 96 degrees, sunny. Typical Austin summer day. And from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, everyone. Um, it is, in fact, the same weather as Vincent outside, <laughs> although it is absolutely freezing in my office. Uh, so it's a big change going inside and outside. August 31st, our last day of August. Wow. That went fast. I never pr- pay attention to summer until it's almost over. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad, but it'll be, it'll be back. When do you start classes? Um, well, the medical students are here. I have to teach them next week, I believe. But my virology doesn't begin until the spring. However, I am going to teach a live streamed virology course uh, on YouTube this fall. <laughs> I'm doing. Oh, an, that's really cool. I'm doing an experiment. Um, it'll be twice a week. Uh, I think about 11 a.m. so I can capture some of Europe, uh, Australia, Asia, forget it. I can't capture them no matter, <laughs> no matter when. But um, a lot of people have uh, expressed interest. So I'm going to you know, do like a two-hour thing and we'll take questions. I'll give them a quiz. I'll show slides. It might be fun. You know? We'll see. Just uh, my, my, my course basically, but you know, live and, and people be able to ask questions and so forth. So I'm hoping to start that at the incubator. And, um, so yesterday I went in and started getting it into shape. I threw out all the cardboard. I, I bought a vacuum cleaner last week and I vacuumed the rug. (laughs) It was very exciting. (laughs) And I actually set up the computer and did some work there. And finally, they secured the doors. I wanted them to put extra locks on the doors before I started bringing expensive equipment in. So they finally did that. And now I have sound treatments coming in and so forth. But I think in two weeks, I can get it uh, ready to do that. So uh, as many days today, I came here because Tuesdays and Fridays, I do mouse work uh, with Amy, so I come up here. But I would like to do these as well from down there as well. Uh, I did a Zoom yesterday, and my behind me it was just a white wall. <laughs> There's nothing. <laughs> Room, it's empty. But the lighting is very good, and it looks great. But So it'll evolve like anything else. Um, so uh, today we're going to do some science. And I decided we should do half COVID and half non-COVID. Um, so we get, we're going to start with COVID and then move into non-COVID and um, see what happens there. And the first is a topic that we've mentioned a lot. It's correlates, immune correlates of protection. And the reason I wanted to talk about this is because a pair of articles uh, has recently been published on this. We're going to talk about one of them today. And, and a review article by Florian Cromer. These are both uh, in Nature Medicine, the, the two that we're going to talk about. Uh, I, Florian was on TWIV in the summer of 2019 at an influenza meeting in Baltimore. I told him I always mistake him for Franz Klammer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, remember the Austrian downhill skier? I don't know if you remember that, but that was when I was young and I watched the Olympics and he he won the gold medal. He was just a daredevil, Franz Klammer. And so Florian said, it's okay if you confuse me with him. <laughs> Florian's at Mount Sinai. And so his review article is, a correlative protection for SARS-CoV-2 vaccines is urgently needed. And, and we're going to define it and talk about how it's been calculated. I think it's important. Now, the subhead of this article is interesting. Recent studies suggest that neutralizing antibodies could serve as a correlative protection for vaccines 
against SARS-CoV-2 in humans. And as you'll see in a moment, correlative protection, you have to define it. It can mean a number of things. So it's I'd, like to, I'd like to even spend a minute uh, defining generally what we mean by correlative protection. Yeah. Because this is one of these, this is one of these phrases, terms that was a mystery to me for a long time. It sounds like big words. Okay. Uh, but I've learned that if you just kind of relax and take it apart, it actually makes some sense. And what this, in this context, what it means is we can measure all sorts of different things about uh, what happens to people when they're either infected or immunized. Okay. And we can uh, measure whether or not they get sick. Okay. And what we'd like to know is, is there something we can measure like something about their immune response that tells us, uh, gives us a, so has some predictive value in whether or not they're going to get sick. So whether or not you're going to get sick, that's protection. Correlate is anything you can measure that correlates with whether or not you're, pro you're protected. Okay. So what we'd like is something that's easy to measure in somebody who's either been vaccinated or whatever, or we can measure that and say, uh, this predicts that you will or will not get sick or be protected from this infection in the future. And so far, we haven't really had that for SARS-CoV-2. We talk about antibody levels and stuff like that all the time, but we don't necessarily know what they mean in terms of whether or not you're protected. Yeah, I, I really appreciated um, this review. Um, so Florian, if you're listening, great job. Um, and one of the things that I really appreciated about it was the way that he discussed kind of the caveats of correlates of protection um, quite nicely. So one thing to remember is that this is correlation. That's why we have correlate in the name. So what we're doing here is we're looking for some immune response that we can measure that happens to be present in those who seem protected and not those who aren't. It actually doesn't tell you that that immune response is doing the protecting. <laughs> it's just an immune response that happens to help us distinguish between those who are protected and those who aren't. Um, and I thought that he <clears throat> described that quite well here. I think he says, so if it's a mechanistic correlate, then it's somehow protecting, right? But yep. an, I guess absolute correlate is just something that correlates and it may or may not be functionally involved, right? Absolutely. So he, and as Rich says, he says most of the, you know, we have a variety of, of uh, responses to infection, um, but single responses like antibody responses may correlate. And in fact, most of the accepted correlates are based on antibody measurements. And he said, that's because they're easy <laughs> to measure. Yeah. Right, he says. In many cases, they may not be the only correlate, but they're most often easier to measure and therefore more clinically useful. So, if you can't easily measure something, it's not clinically useful, right? I, I also really appreciate that point of it may not be the only correlate. So maybe there yes. could be a few different things that could be correlates. And the paper that we'll talk about in, in a bit is one of two attempts to look at antibodies and see if they correlate with protection. And, and, and Cromer also points out, notably, correlates may differ depending on the endpoint, such as protection from infection, protection from disease, from severe disease, from death, right? You always have to specify what you're talking about. It's like yeah, units, right? Protection yeah. from what? Your units. Right. Specify your units. And so when you even when you say vaccine efficacy, you need to define what you're talking about. Did you hear Daniel Griffin <laughs> the other day? He said, My father said, Daniel, vaccine efficacy is declining. And Daniel said, Really, Pop? What does that mean? And Pop said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> pop is that i call well i got a i got an email from you know uh a a friend the other day who uh, actually has i think uh an issue that leaves him modestly immune compromised uh and he he'd been vaccinated and because of some other 
uh, opportunity, got uh, uh, a, an antibody test, and it came back with a number that said he, he had a certain number for uh, a positive for a certain value for reactivity for S antibody and a certain cutoff that says such and such, th this number is positive and his number was greater than positive. He said, what does this mean? I had to say, I don't know. Looks like you got some, some S antibody. What the number means, I don't know. And even if I did know, I wouldn't know whether that means you're protected. But that's right. good on you. You had an immune response. Yeah, that's right. That's no, that's about all I can we say. don't know what any number means at this point. Yeah, but we, we will get some idea from the next study, but still we don't. Now, why but, why but, do you care about a correlative protection? This is actually this yeah, review. That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> what I liked about it is that he, he does a really nice job of saying why we care. So he gives about three or four reasons. And the first one is that the currently licensed vaccines can't be produced in large enough quantities to cover the world. And so we need to have ways to figure out from new vaccines that are going to be brought online, whether or not they're going to be protective. And it's going to be challenging because you're not going to be able to uh, ethically use uh, placebo controlled studies anymore. You're going to need to use a comparison of your test vaccine against an established vaccine. And it's also going to be difficult if there's a reduction in the number of cases. We've talked about this in the past with respect to, for instance, Ebola. When the vaccines came online, they, they couldn't really be tested because the outbreak had decreased to a point where it, it wasn't going to be feasible. And so that's important. And, and he makes especially the case that a lot of these uh, additional vaccines that are uh, in the works are in uh, low income or low and middle income countries that might not be able to have a really large clinical trial. So even with, uh, uh, can't think of the word, uh, the number of cases declining uh, potentially, um, you could you could have a really huge clinical trial and still come up with the answers, but these low and middle income countries are not going to be able to afford to do that, and so um, having these correlates of protection might allow you kind of a, a shortcut to getting at um, are the vaccines efficacious. And then the the last two reasons that I marked were. Um, it could allow healthcare workers to manage the vaccination of immunocompromised individuals, just like Rich was saying about his friend. And it could allow healthcare and governing bodies to figure out what percentage of the population is infected, that holy grail of that guideline of R naught. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Now, the. Um there's a, there's a statement here I want to say. At present, the messaging from regulatory agencies states that antibody tests should not be used to evaluate a person's level of immunity or protection from COVID-19. But what the hell is the narrative doing with the boosters now? What do you think they're doing? They're looking at declining antibody levels and they're saying, oh my God, we need boosters. So is that a little bit of a paradox? Yeah, because that's what we be measure. An individual versus population level <laughs> difference there. So the but, you um, know, who's but who's saying we uh, this is a who's saying we need boosters? It's not CDC, is it? Yeah, CDC it's thinks a, CDC is saying we may need boosters. Yeah, um, and and WHO is saying we may need boosters, and cardiologists okay. are saying we need boosters. You know. <laughs> All right. So anyway. This is important. And another statement here, also important. If there is no detectable antibody response after vaccination, the vaccines may still confer protection through cellular immunity. And we talked Jesus. about that a couple of weeks ago, how after the first vaccine dose in the trials, there was protection starting at about 11 days where they didn't detect any neutralizing antibodies, most likely T cells. All right. So, and they say, so he says, Still, cellular responses to antibody often correlate, right? You need CD4 T cells in general to make antibodies. So there's going to be some correlation there. So that's um, those are all really good points. And then, then he goes on to talk about the actual papers, um, which we'll do, which we will do now. 
And in the one we we'll do one and it's just an interesting way to approach this. Um, and then he talks about, he says, although certain correlates can be non-mechanistic, right? Meaning an immune marker that indicates protection, but does not cause it. Antibodies are often mechanistic correlates, especially if they're capable of neutralizing the pathogen in question. And what you're gonna see is that there is, I think, a bifurcation. The antibodies are good at, they're correlates of mild disease, but perhaps T cells are correlates of protection against severe disease. There's also different ways of measuring antibodies. Yeah, right? that's a problem, right? Mm -hmm. it's, well, who said that? Um, someone said it on one of our guest shows that there's no standard for measuring uh, neutralizing antibodies. Everyone does it in different ways. Some people use pseudotypes, some people don't. They measure it differently. So we do need to standardize. Does anyone remember who said that? Was that Fouché? I don't know. All right. Uh, at, at any rate, for uh, listeners who are interested in, after this, digging into this further, this uh, review, it's a commentary really, is very readable, mm -hmm. okay, and, and quick. Uh, so you can do that. You don't necessarily have to read the papers and it's, it's well done. All right. So the paper I thought we would do is um, also from Nature Medicine. Neutralizing antibody levels are highly predictive of immune protection from symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection. Curie, Cromer, Reynaldi, Schlub, Wheatley, Junos, Contasubaro is here, Kent, Trickus and Miles Davenport from a variety of uh, institutions uh, in Australia. So this one um, is is a is a study where they have looked at the results of trials to try and figure out if there's a correlation between antibody levels uh, and protection. And they repeat in their discussion, in their introduction, some of the things we've already said, why it's good to have a, a correlative protection. And I want to point out that for influenza, now, influenza has been studied for many years, right? And they say for influenza, a hemagglutina hemagglutination inhibition titer, HAI. So it's an assay where, so you can add influenza virus to red blood cells and it will agglutinate them, and you can measure the agglutination uh, in, a, in, a, in a certain way and get a tighter hemagglutination tighter. Then you can add antibodies to the virus and prevent hemagglutination. So that's what hemagglutination uh, inhibition titer, HAI. And you do it in twofold dilutions. And so you dilute the serum until you don't get any more inhibition of hemagglutination. And they say an HAI titer of one to 40 is thought to provide 50% protection from influenza infection. So I looked at that word infection and I said, do they mean infection <laughs> or do they mean something else? So I went back to reference number seven, which is uh, a paper from 1972, ancient history, right? It's just the kind of paper you only get a PDF of and that you can see it's scanned because all the type is crinkly. But they're looking at infection. They actually did a challenge uh, study of people and they took nasal washes periodically and looked for um, protection against infection. So there's a correlate of protection against infection, an HAI titer of one to 40. So if you, in any, in any given influenza season, if you see that the sera from vaccinated people drop below that because of a variant that's arisen, right? Which happens frequently for influenza virus. That's when they think about formulate, reformulating the vaccine based on this, because they have this correlative protection, right? And they also, when they launch a new vaccine, they don't do a trial that's right. uh, in, this, in the sense of, uh, you know, looking to see who gets disease or anything like that. They look at they vaccinate a number of people and look at serum antibody. Yeah, they do and an HI test. This, yeah. yeah. And they say, okay, since we take the have, virus that's circulating now. Is it one to 40 or greater? Then we're good. Right? Yes, exactly right. And so that's because it's been studied, as they say, studied over many years using data from a standardized assay, the standardized HAI assay, uh, on using serological samples from challenge and cohort studies. 
And in fact, some of the methods they use in this paper is based on uh, the methods used to figure out the, uh, the correlative protection for uh, influenza viruses. But they say at the moment, there are few standardized assays for assessing SARS-CoV-2 immunity. Uh, little data comparing immune levels in susceptible versus resistant people and no human challenge model. Whatever happened to the one in the UK they were going to do? Remember that? Oh, that's right. <laughs> I don't know. Hope, worked, hopefully yeah. it didn't go forward. <laughs> they were going to use young, healthy people who should be yeah. fine. Remember that? Wow, <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Who, mm -hmm. who may still get long COVID. I don't think they ever did that, but I'm not sure. So for, in this paper, they have uh, phase one and two immunogenicity uh, results from the vaccines. And then they have protection uh, in the phase three. And they also have um, convalescent individuals um, where we take their serum and use them in, in, uh, in protection studies. And they say here, although antiviral T and B cell memory certainly contribute some protection, strong evidence of a protective role for antibody exists. And that's passive transfer of antibodies, right? Can prevent infection both in animals and in people. The monoclonal studies were done. They would give people monoclonals and show that it prevented them from getting infected. Um, but of course, all these phase one and two use different assays because they're different companies. And so that was a little bit of a challenge for them. And they also say uh, the definition of convalescence is not even standardized. <laughs> Now we talk about convalescent serum. Well, what does it exactly mean? Um, so, but at uh, least within a given study, the uh, uh, assay that they use to assess convalescent serum is likely to be the same assay that they use yeah. to assess the serum of the individuals. Right. So there's <laughs> experimental, but there's methodological consistency within a study. Okay. And so if you can make a comparison to convalescent serum, even if the, the methods are different in a different study, in that study, you can make a comparison to convalescent serum and you hope yeah. that you can then compare one serum, one study to another. That's kind of the best you can do. And I thought it was pretty clever yeah, at to this use point, the yeah. convalescent serum within a study as a standard. Yeah. At this point, I mean, I think at some point in the future, you can do it better, you can standardize assays and so forth. But for now, yeah, might as well do it. So they determine the mean and standard deviation of the neutralization titer in the data which have been published from seven vaccine studies. So we have the Moderna, we have uh, Novavax, we have Pfizer, we have some Ad no Recom, Ad26 and Ad5, Chadox, and COVID-19. Add 26 and CoronaVac. The 26 right. and 5 one is Sputnik. 26 yeah. plus 5 is Sputnik, right? Chadox is the Oxford one. And the Add 26 CoV2 is J &J. the Janssen 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 Janssen. What's N CoV19? Anybody know? That that used to be the name for SARS-CoV2. Yeah, but it's a vaccine name, right? So uh, uh, I, think the, I think it's Chadox is the, the name. Uh, oh, the I see. It's no part vector. of Chadox. Yeah. 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 Yes. Okay. It's part of chat. And CoronaVac, which one is that? That's an inactivated uh, uh, vaccine made uh, by Sinovac in China. That's the name of my vacuum cleaner, by the way. In, in the <laughs> <laughs> CoronaVac, right? That would be good. <clears throat> um, in one convalescent study. So as we've said, they use different assays in each study for measuring neutralization. So that what they did is they took the neutralization titers and normalized them to the mean convalescent titer uh, using the same assay in the same study. And, would, and they point out again that even convalescence is not standardized, but what can we do? And then they compared this to the nor this normalized neutralization level in each study against the efficacy from the seven phase three clinical trials. All right. And they say, be, despite all these issues, uh, there's a really good nonlinear relationship between neutralization, the mean neutralization, and the reported protection across uh, different vaccines. All right, so uh, they're now going to estimate the protective neutralization level against COVID, right? Um, and they used an approach which was used uh, for influenza 
uh, infection. It's, these these studies involve comparison of HAI titers, hemagglutination inhibition titers, in infected versus uninfected subjects, uh, either naturally infected or challenged, and use statistical procedures to uh, identify a titer that provides protection. By the way, I have done an HAI assay as a graduate student. I used to do those uh, all the time. They were a lot of fun. We used to do them in 96 well plates and we would have uh, dilutions across in different samples from top to bottom. I think in a 96 well plate, how many rows are they? Are there 12 rows? Does anyone remember? It's it's eight down and 12 across. Okay, so eight down. And we would have eight of these little stirrer thingies. They were metal rods with a, a, a contraption at the end that would mix it. And you would put all eight of them between your hands and and rotate them like this. And then you'd pick them up and move them to the next and to do twofold serial dilutions. I remember a technician taught me this and I'm watching her. I'm going, I'm never going to get, I'm going to drop them. And I did drop them in the beginning because <laughs> you have eight of them that you have to, and they're all like tilted towards each other. So they fit in between your hands and you have to pick them up, but you get it after a while. And the, the tip of these, grab a certain volume and then they transfer it to the next one. So you can do, it's, I'll never forget it. You know, why haven't I forgotten it? It's very, I guess it's formative. It's in the beginning. Anyway. Years ago when I was challenged uh, to write the <laughs> field chapter on principles of virology, I talked about techniques for assaying viruses. I had never done an HAI test. Okay. And I um, uh, wondered how common this was. So I wrote Peter Palazzi. I said, do you mm. guys really do this? <laughs> he said, every day. Yeah. And I said, send me a picture, uh, which he did, which is in the book. But I also did plaque assays with influenza viruses because that was a different kind of read. Anyway, so they uh, use these procedures developed for influenza virus to try and figure out the, the protection level for these, the results that we've just talking about. So they use a logistic model to do this and so forth. So they estimate 50% protective neutralization level, 20% roughly of the mean convalescent serum level, 20%, okay? So 20% of what we see in the, in the convalescent serum is, is the protective level among, across all of these uh, vaccine trials. Enough to protect 50% of the people. Right. And you got a 50% chance of being protected, if put it that way. If you have 20% of the yeah. mean level in convalescent serum, right. yeah. I'd, so, I'd prefer to have a higher titer. Yeah, so like so I. in engineering principles, your body overdoes it. And so that's why, uh, yeah, it's only 20% seems to be needed for 50%. Yeah, man, but that's for all... That's for all infection. That's for COVID, any kind of COVID, right? right? Well, wait, no, all infection, not all disease. Um, no, this is for COVID because the trials were all for COVID, right? Okay. Right? right, not for so all infection. So, so it's all for disease. It's, yeah. it's for all disease. And any for... kind of COVID, right? We're going to actually- Symptomatic disease. Symptomatic disease, yeah. We're going to get- Mild, severe, moderate, Yeah, death. exactly. And this, and this uh, equates to a neutralization titer of between 1 to 10 and 1 to 30, or 54 international units. A lot of people get results of antibody tests and they go, what, what are these units? <laughs> there you go. If you have 54, that means you're about 50% protected, right? You can go either way. Do you have any idea what those international units are, what that test is? Is that an ELISA? I'll bet you it's an ELISA, not a neutralization is. test. Yeah, it might be. I don't know. But I don't know how you would do that because you're going to get antibodies that way that bind but don't neutralize, right? Right. I don't know. It's a good question. Okay. And then they tested this. So is this accurate? And they did runs, uh, which they, they where they left out uh, one of the of the um, vaccine results. And they, they tried to see if they could predict it and they did pretty well. They were able to predict it uh, most of the, all the time they got the right number that matched to the, um, to the, the result in the clinical trial. I, th I thought that was a really important thing to do that 
to show that their yeah. their model and their predictive ability did pan out. If you dropped out one, could you predict its results? A leave one it. out approach, they called it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. I found it interesting that uh, according to these results, some vaccines gave an average response that exceeded what convalescent serum did yeah and some did not that's right okay mm-hmm. yeah I, I remember noting that in some of the data um in some of the at least the the pfizer trial data the other thing that's interesting is that while they were doing this the phase three results of another vaccine bbv152 were released and so they took the neutralization level that was part of the trial, and they predicted the efficacy would be 79.6%, and it turned out to be 80.6% that the company calculated from their data. So they said, hey, our model's pretty good. <laughs> it hits it. Um, so yeah, that's kind of cool. So, all right, so that's 20% of uh, convalescent titer seems to be 50% protection. So then they did some studies to look at how long this would last. And they point out that some studies have shown a decline in titer for uh, up to eight months after in, after infection. And that's true because as we have said many times, right, antibody titers always decline. They just don't go to zero. And then they say, are vaccine-induced responses any different from what we see following uh, infection? So they make a model of exponential decay to um, try and address this. They, can, they, can, they have de- time points of um, neutralization titers uh, different days after. And as, as this study w- went up to 115 days uh, after vaccination. Of course, now you could do it uh, even longer. And this was um, mR- mRNA-based vaccination. Uh, and they found... God, I hate when the text jumps across a whole figure <laughs> and you can't find it after either mRNA-based um, vaccination. Okay, we found similar half-lives between uh, vaccination and um, infection. They say it suggests the K of vaccine-induced neutralization is similar to that observed after natural infection. Okay, everybody good on that? The decay is similar between after natural infection and uh, vaccination, mRNA vaccination. Next, can we use the relationship between neutralization and protection to predict how, this is what they say, I want to use their words, how the observed waning of neutralization titers might affect vaccine effectiveness. All right, so you have to define effectiveness. Hopefully they're going to do this. And they have caveats to this approach. And the first one is, the assumption is that neutralization is the major mechanism of protection, which is good that that's a caveat because it so is, right? Because <laughs> right. that- well, and But if you look at that sentence, they, they continue to say, or that the mechanism of protection remains correlated it's with correlated, neutralization yeah. over time. And that was in fact, my biggest question here ah, is- Okay, good point. Mm-hmm. Is- Maybe early on, your level of neutralizing antibodies correlates with protection, but perhaps later, yeah, um, it's more about the memory B cells, and that, and, and so the T correlation cells. doesn't hold up over time. That's right, um, and I'm glad that they pointed that out. That's right, because the B cells are always there; they're not waning. It's just the antibody titer is waning, right? And they have the T cell responses. Also, the T cells responses may be more durable. They say it may play a larger role later. Uh, and the other caveat, it applies that the, the decay of neutralization um, observed in convalescence to the vaccine data, that we're making an assumption there, and an assumption that the decay in titer is the same regardless of the initial starting titer, which you're going to see is not true, right? So they looked at the half-life of neutralization up to eight months after infection, and their estimate is that neutralization titer decays with a half-life of 108 days. That's just neutralization titer, right? And they tried some other models and they all came out with the same 
num half-life, okay? So that looks good. So then they take this half-life of 108 days to model the decay of neutralization and protection against COVID over 250 days, for which they don't have data yet, but they're going to model it based on up to 108 days. And what the model predicts is that even if the different vaccine, the waning of neutralization titers is different for the different vaccines, um, the decay will have nonlinear effects on the level of protection, depending on what your initial vaccine efficacy was. For example, if you start at 95% efficacy against any COVID, any symptomatic COVID, you by 250 days, you should still be at 77% efficacy. But if you start at 70%, then by 250 days, you're going to be at 33%. So that's what they mean by nonlinear effects. Depends where you start. So better to start out higher if you're worried about decay of antibody. It's, it's as if, according to the model, the immunity is more durable if you start out with a higher titer. Yeah. Yep. And they say something I, I like very much. They say, clearly data generated from standardized assays are needed to track the long-term decay uh, of immune responses and the relationship to clinical protection. That's the key, right? Don't, not just neutralization titer, but clinical protection. That is what is important, right? We're seeing still clinical protection against serious disease uh, by many vaccines, despite uh, decay in neutralization titer. And then they say, which is relevant, if a disconnect between the decay of neutralization titer and clinical, I was stuck in clinical, protection is observed, this may be a direct pointer to the role of non-neutralizing responses in protection. Uh, could be T cells, right? Yeah. <laughs> or maybe non-neutralizing antibodies that you're not measuring, that could be as well. So I like that because that's like, okay, so if it turns out that our correlation is not um, uh, completely consistent for everything we're measuring, it doesn't mean we're wrong. It means there's something else going on. That's right. You have to that acknowledge. We need to look at. I think you have to acknowledge it. You cannot. I mean, many studies they don't consider it, right? They just look at the antibody sure. waning. But they, <clears throat> you have to talk about these other things because that's how uh, things get propagated that are not correct. Mm -hmm. All right. So as, that, I, as I was reading through this, I was worrying or thinking that people might just go to the conclusion that the neutralizing antibodies are the correlative <laughs> protection. Yeah, yeah, and right. I was thinking, but what about T cells? Was all that stuff we've said, it, it, were we throwing that out? So yeah, I'm glad we've had this and, discussion. And we're going we're gonna to get to that actually in a moment. So the next they looked at variants, right? As the variants have emerged, they become more resistant to neutralization. Reduced Sierra have reduced neutralize, neutralization titers. So, um, for example, B1.351, the, uh, what is that, beta, right? This, uh, this the beta, I believe that's the beta variant. Uh, the neutralization titers is 7 to 6.6 .6 to 9-fold lower compared with neutralization against the ancestral virus. And so they put their model onto these variants and they say, our model predicts that a lower neutralization titer against a variant will have a larger effect on vaccines for which the initial protective efficacy was lower, right? So if you're 95% to begin with, you're going to be less impacted by the decline in neutralization uh, against the variants. And if you're at 70% initially, you're going to have a harder time, right? Um, so a five-fold lower neutralization titer is predicted to reduce efficacy from 95 to 77 or from 70 to 32, right? So that's at, what at I, this point, it's important to point out that we're pretty deep into modeling. Yes. Right. At this point. It's all modeling. We started, we started out with data. Okay. And and we have we have uh, slowly but surely gotten weighted into a lot of modeling. In fact, this whole TWIV is not that is, it's not that it's bad. No, no. Okay, and, and so just coincidentally, both papers 
Our modeling, our whole modeling, actually. It's a, it's a very model TWIV. <laughs> it's a model TWIV We have a little bit of data and then you model, but it's good because you do modeling and then you can go out and collect the data and ask, does it agree with the model or does it disagree? I think it's and useful. I do. And I also agree with the point that Rich made that when you actually go back and look to see if data agree with the model, that can give you insights into things that may or may not be important, like those non-neutralizing responses. Right. Next, they ask, what about protection against severe disease? Because so far we have looked at protection against any symptomatic infection, right? Any kind of COVID. Um, and they say, be, why we're doing this? Because maybe the immune response gives greater protection from severe versus mild infection. So they could look at their data and uh, and take a look at this. Um, and they also say that the definition of severe infection is not consistent <laughs> across all of the studies, right? So your severe is not the same uh, as mine. And listen to this, in all the phase three trials that they have looked at, there were fewer than a hundred severe infections involved because there aren't there weren't that many at the time, I suppose. So that means the, the they're going to there's going to be a lot of variation in their modeling results. But when they do this, so remember the neutralization uh, level for fifty percent protection against any kind of COVID was twenty percent of the convalescent level, right? For severe infection, it's three percent, much lower. You need much lower neutralization levels to protect you against severe disease, which tells me, well, I don't know, and I may be wrong, that something else is going on there. Maybe maybe T cells, right? Because only 3% is not a lot. Is that, does that make sense? And I yeah, say- I was- Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead <laughs> I was just gonna, uh, what comes to mind is a little bit of immunity goes a long way, okay? Uh, but I, I, uh, I think it's also relevant, yeah, that uh, uh, there's more than just neutralization going on. In fact, they say that an important caveat to this analysis is the implicit assumption that neutralization titer itself confers protection. However, it's possible that T cell responses or recall of memory B cell responses may also be important in protection from severe disease, right? So T cells could be helping you, which we've said all along, or you've got memory B cells, even if the antibody titer is low, they can be activated and make more antibody if you get infected and that could help, right? So- Yeah, absolutely. So I kind of think about this paper as having um, outcomes for or sort of take home messages for slightly different audiences. <laughs> Um, so I think that in sort of a clinical perspective, this is really important because neutralizing antibodies do have that uh, benefit of ease of measurement. And so they are frequently going to be something that one might measure in that vaccine trial that we talked about in a uh, country that isn't going to be able to, to do the full vaccine trial, but who wants to look at, does this vaccine work? Um, you're likely you know, going to have the easiest time measuring antibodies. You're likely going to have the easiest time as a uh, physician measuring your patient's antibodies to say, does this patient need a boost or something? You know, you can imagine lots of outcomes where you're going to have to measure antibodies. So it's important for us to be able to answer the question of do neutralizing antibodies serve as a correlate? What this paper doesn't tell us is, is this the only correlate? Could other things... Um, be the correlate. And so maybe neutralizing antibodies, uh, you need 3% of the convalescent level of neutralizing antibodies. You need a higher level of T cells. Maybe T cells also correlate really nicely and they tell us something slightly different. And this paper doesn't address this. So it doesn't say neutralizing antibodies are the only correlate. It says that they are a correlate. And that's great clinically for geeky immunologists um, who want to know things about well, what about all these other things? Do they correlate as well? You could imagine some massive study that no one probably has the full expertise to do because you'd need to measure T cells and memory B cells and antibodies and all sorts of things. Um, you could imagine that and that would tell us all the correlates. 
Um, but this is really useful in telling us a correlate for uh, clinical disease. And so there are things my geeky immunologist self would like, but this is still really important. But, but the 3% is important because you will it live, is. you will live yes. even with anti waning antibody titers or most people will, right? 50% in this, in this modeling. Um, and Tuesday, I believe we have Shane Crotty returning. So we can ask him, how could you make a, an easy T cell assay that could rival a neutralization assay and be Clinically useful. Love it. <laughs> right? Because that would really revolutionize things if we could do that. I don't see why we couldn't. All right. So the last thing they do is ask uh, about long-term protection, right? So um, they say the severe, the, the neutralization level you need for protection against severe disease, as we've just said, is sixfold lower than what you need to protect against any symptomatic infection. So they, that by extension, they would say, maybe uh, a higher level uh, of, of protection against severe infection would be observed for any amount, of, uh, for any level of vaccine efficacy. Uh, and if this is constant over time, maybe protection against severe disease is more durable than against any symptomatic disease, okay? And they cite some long-term studies of uh, antibody responses to vaccinia, measles virus, mumps, rubella, which suggests that these uh, responses stabilize with half-lives of over 10 years. Immunity to severe infection, half-lives of over 10 years with all those other viruses. So they projected out their, again, modeling, uh, they project out their decay of uh, antibody responses uh, out to eight months after infection and under the assumption that after eight months, the decay rate will slow down based on these other viruses, okay? Mm -hmm. And they modeled the decay rate, assuming it slowed linearly to a 10-year half-life uh, over one, one and a half, or two years, three different calculations. And the results predict that even without immune boosting, a significant proportion of people may maintain long-term protection from severe infection, uh, even by an antigenically similar strain, because they didn't model the, the different ones in. They will get a mild infection. They will get a mild infection, but they'll be uh, protected from severe infection for a long time, extrapolating from those other viruses, which may not be be correct, but that's an, and that's a study which we need 10 years to do, right? Or at least years. I thought that was very illuminating. And I didn't know that for these other viruses, the half-life against neutralization, half-life against severe disease stable has half-lives of over 10 years. Um, vaccinia, measles, mumps, rubella. These are viruses with viremic stages, if I'm not mistaken, and that may play a big role in it. Right. We talked about this a long time ago, I think, with uh, John Udell. And somehow these viremic infections uh, do, do something rather differently. So it may not be the same for SARS-CoV-2. So there you go. Um, that's uh, the estimate of a correlative protection for any COVID, for severe COVID. And why is this interesting? As we said earlier, there, there are a bunch of reasons why it's, uh, it's interesting. Now, here's a, here's a point I wanted to emphasize. Now, our model predicts that immune protection from infection may wane with time. Uh, I'm not sure infection is the right word. I think they compressed it, meaning any symptomatic COVID, because that's actually what they did in this paper. And it's really important to use the right words, I think, because I see infection, I go, wait, do you mean infection or do you mean symptomatic disease? Okay, it can be confusing. It, they do that a few times in this paper, actually. They, go, they, they revert to infection, right? As a kind of a shorthand, yeah. All right, so they say that our model predicts that immune protection may wane and booster immunization may be required within a year. However, protection from severe infection may be considerably more durable. And I think that is the debate right now, right? Yeah. Do we need a booster if we want to protect against any kind of COVID or are we content to pr protect against severe disease? Um, I don't, I'm not, look, I have some friends who are fully vaccinated, two doses of Pfizer. They got 
COVID a couple of weeks ago, they said to me, if we didn't get tested and knew we were PCR positive, we would have thought this was just a summer cold, right? Sniffling, stuffy nose and so forth. So I, I, I yeah, that's the debate that's going on now. Um, the, 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 just, go ahead, go ahead, yes. Uh, I was just gonna say that uh, Florian Kramer mentions that there's two different papers and uh, we chose one to talk about here. The other one right. is in vaccine by Kristen Earle and others um, uh, from a variety of entities. But listen to this. I think it kind of gives you the nice summary of what we've just been talking about. Uh, we evaluated the relationship between efficacy and in vitro neutralizing and binding antibodies of seven vaccines for which sufficient data have been generated. Once calibrated to titers of human convalescent sera reported in each study, a robust correlation was seen between neutralizing titer and efficacy. And, and they even talk about binding antibody titer and efficacy uh, in their abstract. So same kind of thing. Same they thing. looked at yeah. the seven vaccines. They used convalescent sera as their sort of external standard among all the different vaccine assays and got the same result. Good, good. I just had an idea. Uh, you can get a booster vaccination if you bring in somebody who's unvaccinated and get them vaccinated. Is that right? You mean you're thinking of that as a, yeah, as a motivation? That's my, that, yeah, that's my motivation. That's not a bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how do you know they're not vaccinated, though? They could just say, but that would be oh. fine. What the heck? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. I want to just point out a few more things in the discussion, which I think are useful. Um, um, first of all, the association of neutralization with protection does not prove that neutralizing antibodies are necessarily mechanistic in mediating protection. We already said that, but I think some things are worth repeating. Yep. Peter Palazzi always told me, it doesn't hurt to repeat things in a lecture two or three times. And I won't say who, who we were lecturing to because some people may take offense. <laughs> Thus, it will be important to study other responses such as T-cells or B-cell memory responses, as we have said. Another important refinement would be to have standardized measures of other serological and cellular responses to identify if any of these would provide a better predictive value. So let me put you on the spot, Brianne. Other serological and cellular, so like non-neutralizing antibody responses, maybe? So like non-neutralizing antibody responses, um, maybe uh, some kind of, I guess, cytokine response, although I don't know that you'd expect that to be quite so long-term. Um, NK probably cells? May, maybe NK cells. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe the uh, trained immune response of the sort of memory monocyte uh, mm -hmm. response, right. you know, any of those kind of things. Okay. Mm, and the other thing... Uh, our approach utilizes the wide range of immunogenicity and protection across all these vaccines. By contrast, studies in influenza infection use data from the HAI titer of individual subjects and their risk of infection in either cohort or challenge studies. So different, right? This is a, a, a population analysis in this paper in the flu. You can do it individually because you do challenge studies. Interesting, right? And then the last thing, our results are consistent with studies of both influenza and seasonal coronavirus infection for which reinfection is possible one year after the initial infection, although it usually results in mild infection. Similarly, after influenza virus vaccination, protective efficacy is thought to decline by around 7% a month. I don't know what they mean by protective efficacy. I think... Um, and the paper is from 9, 2017, intra-season waning of influenza vaccine protection. I wonder if it's infection or disease. I bet it's infection because that's what the other flu paper was. Anyway, so I, I think this is this feeds into this idea that eventually once most of the world is uh, immune, either by vaccination or infected infection, then maybe uh, you'll get reinfected frequently because the virus is always going to be around and maybe it'll be mild, common cold. Common cold corona number five. Yeah, to me, the uh, one of the big questions there is, are we going to 
keep vaccinating indefinitely? Or are we just going to, maybe not after a while, just maybe not let the virus do the job? Although maybe it's going to be a while. I mean, Fred, uh, oh, it's going to be a while. Barrick mentioned that the first time he was on in February. Yep. Maybe it becomes a common cold corona. And um, it, uh, yeah, maybe we don't have to. Wouldn't that be amazing? We stop after all this, we stop vaccinating. That would be yeah, something for the textbooks. Absolutely. I think it's going to depend on, you know, when uh, we get to a higher percentage of people who are uh, protected. I, I was really struck by those comments from Paul B. Nash um, about population level uh, immunity and vaccines. And I've been thinking about them a lot since that previous episode. So I think that would be the big variable here. All right. I have a challenge for you songwriters out there. So this could be common cold coronavirus number five. Remember the song <laughs> Mambo number five? One, two, three, four, five. Make a song for coronavirus, common cold corona number five. You guys know what I'm talking about? Mambo number I, five? I know exactly what you're talking okay. about. Yes. <laughs> I mean, my kids used to listen to that all the time. It's like a Disney song or something. All right. Was that good? Did we learn? Yeah. I learned a lot from this. I really yes, like this. I like this. I read this yeah, a few weeks ago and I said, we need to do this. I plan on rereading this paper and going through a lot of details of the uh, references. Go through it with your I class. I think I'll be reading a lot of, yeah, I might be going <laughs> through it with my class and I'm going to be using a lot of these references. All right. Now, if you'd like more modeling, stick around <laughs> because now we have a non-COVID paper from eLife. And it is called Physiology and Ecology Combined to Determine Host and Vector Importance for Ross River Virus uh, from Kane, Skinner, Van der Herk, McCallum, and Mordecai. And you notice, Kathy, Hamish McCallum. Mm -hmm. I used to have a colleague here, Hamish Young. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and these are from Stanford University Um the uh, Department of Health in Brisbane, Australia, and Griffith University in Queens in Nathan, Queensland, Australia. How on earth did you identify this baby? <laughs> yes, that's my question too. You guys don't like it? No, I like it. it well, I mean, I that. don't. I I I understand it only at a superficial level. Yes, okay? and I think that and I I didn't spend a I didn't to, to tell you the honest truth. I didn't spend a lot of time on it. OK, mm. uh, because uh, it would take me a lifetime to get down into it. But even on a superficial level, it highlights uh, complexities of viruses in out there in nature that I had never considered before. OK, yeah, that, that's but why I liked it. That's why I liked it, yeah. because it is trying to look at a complicated host vector situation and get with a little bit of data, do some modeling and and come to some conclusions. I mean, we, I agree it's, it's, you know, the modeling is beyond me, but I think the, the bigger pictures are, the bigger questions are accessible. So. So you didn't answer the question. How did I find it? <laughs> well, yeah. I, I saw the title. I, I screen the, you know, the literature. I have an RSS reader where I read, I screen paper titles. And if one looks interesting, I can click at it and go to the, the journal right away. Okay. So I, I thought Ross River virus would be interesting. Um, and then physiology, physiology and ecology. And then I read the abstract and um, it said that, you know, we were able to, oh, here's the key sentence that got me rich. Okay. We find that vertebrate hosts with high physiological competence are not the most important for community transmission. Interactions between hosts and vectors largely underpin the importance of host species. I thought that was pretty cool. So I picked it and then I started to read it and I got, and I said, they're going to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, <laughs> you know, I just, I just, I, I, I just don't worry about it too much anymore. I, uh, I, so I we, recognize that the modeling is very difficult, but we can do so this. <laughs> we need my, Kathy, we need Kathy's summary. Well, my terminology is that we are out of our lane, kind of. Yeah. Out of our lane. Evaluating this <laughs> <Yeah>. paper. <laughs> yeah. Well, we can talk Still. about the system and what they yeah. observe for sure. So this is, uh, first of all, the point here is that, and I didn't know that 60% of existing infectious diseases of humans are multi-host pathogens. That is, they move between non-human 
and human population, 60%. That's a lot. I mean, we're spoiled That's by huge. like polio and measles, where it's just pretty much exclusively human or some herpes viruses, but it's not the rule, 60%. And so it's not easy to study those. I mean, there are some where it's a simple uh, vector. It's one vector in a, in a reservoir species and then humans. But then, as you will see here, there are many where there's not only humans involved, but a bunch of mammals and a bunch of different mosquitoes. And I have no <laughs> idea. I've just, I was on a conversation earlier uh, this morning where uh, I was making a big deal about how it's remarkable how uh, so many viruses maintain really strict species barriers. Right. Right. Okay, and then I look at this paper and I go, "What? Okay, <laughs> this virus is talk about a generalist." Yes. Okay. Exactly. Really gets in fact, really gets around. And they use that word too, uh, which we used last week on Twib. Yeah, and and this becomes super important um, when we think about things like emerging infections and where they come from, sure. but also control. Um, the strategies that you could use to control a virus that only infects humans are going to be very different than a strategy that you could use for one that has humans, sure. one kind of mosquito and one host versus one that has many different types of hosts. And so if you want to think about how you are going to impact an epidemic, this is super important. So let me try the summary mm -hmm. okay. Okay, before we get too deep into this. And Kathy, you could backfill. <laughs> oh, sure. So the paper uh, uses uh, Ross River virus uh, as basically a, a model to look at a, a, a certain concept of maintenance of a virus in nature. Ross River virus is an alpha virus, positive strand RNA virus. Uh, it's a, an a enveloped, it's a toga virus. Uh, it causes... Uh, and arthralgia, uh, so uh, ar arthritis, uh, inflammation of the joints, uh, and is uh, a problem in many different parts of the world. It's also an arthropod-borne virus. That is, it's carried by mosquitoes. And as Brianne pointed out last time we were together, it actually replicates in the mosquitoes uh, as a part of its transmission. Uh, and it also infects a number of vertebrate hosts, okay? And it cycles back and forth between them as is typical of arthropod-borne viruses. So you got a mosquito uh, that cooks up a bunch of virus, bites a mammalian host, who then cooks up a bunch of virus and may or may not get sick. Another mosquito takes a blood meal off of that and it cycles. Now, the interesting thing about this is that this particular virus infects a number of different species of mosquito and a number of different species of animal, including humans and several others. Uh, and it, it can be, these cycles can be divided into enzootic. I think this is a little artificial because it says that humans are not animals in a way. <laughs> enzootic, <laughs> enzootic means that it cycles between uh, non-human vertebrates and mosquitoes, uh, and uh, what do they call domestic cycle, which means mosquitoes and humans. But forget it. Bunch of different mosquitoes, bunch of different vertebrates. And the question is, which are the most important? And what are the factors? That's okay, right. that right. that really are important in maintaining these various cycles. Uh, is it cooking up a lot of virus in a mosquito? Uh, is it density? of the creatures? Is it accessibility of mosquitoes to vertebrate animals? Uh, and it's extraordinarily complex. And this is an attempt to model all that, take all of these mosquitoes, all of these vertebrates and this virus and figure out in a given circumstance, which are the most important factors and which are the most important of the creatures in maintaining the virus. Fair enough? Yes, fair enough. Yeah, I exactly. think that's great. I, I think that sort of to go to that sentence that Vincent quoted, which to me was also a really key sentence. Um, one thing you might have originally thought if you didn't look at some of the, these modeling is you might've said, well, the, the creature that's the most important 
is the one that the virus seems best adapted to the one that the virus reproduces the best yeah, in yeah. and has the most virus. And so maybe naively you'd think that, um, but here they're looking to see, is it something else? Um, or is it just the one that the virus seems best matched to? Yeah. So, and go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say one line in the discussion uh, toward the beginning of the discussion is describing how they did this and they, uh, they they get some results that pretty much match what people had thought, you know, by by popular opinion, and then some surprising results that didn't match. And so that's interesting. Uh, but the way that they did this was using what they call a nested approach mm -hmm. that uses one existing data, two uncertainty. This is where. I'm out of my lane when it uses an approach that uses uncertainty. And then three also sounds to me like uncertainty because it's a complex dynamic uh, and the complex dynamic interactions that underpin the transmission of multi-host multi-vector pathogens. So um, yeah, that's what they do, but they, they start with some existing data. Yeah. And, Make models. Uh, model from there. So this uh, Ross River virus, the reason this is out of uh, Australia, it's a problem. It's it's responsible for the greatest number of mosquito-borne human disease notifications in that country, 5,000 cases a year. And it's also caused outbreaks in Pacific Islands, tens of thousands of cases, and it could move. It could spread elsewhere. We just don't know. And just to emphasize the complexity in the introduction they here, they say, under controlled laboratory conditions, more than 30 species of mosquitoes right. from at least five genera have right. demonstrated physiologic ability to transmit the virus. And they say, most important uh, vertebrate hosts are highly ambiguous because more than 50 species right. have demonstrated serologic evidence of natural exposure to RRV. Man, this guy gets around. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. And, you know, which, what kind of settings? Is it a urban setting? Is it a rural setting, right? Are there rats in um, hotels and train stations <laughs> or out in the <laughs> wild? Just, um, just think if you wanted to try and figure out from where this virus emerged. You oh, know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they did this in Brisbane mainly where the, the virus is endemic. It's there. And, um, they say, so they want to know what host and vectors are the most physiologically competent. If we think about the ecology, how does that impact our view of the transmission cycle? And how do the viruses move through the different species? What vectors and what hosts are important? And, they, and as Kathy said, they use this, this uh, nested approach. And in fact, I'm going to show you this figure because it's um, pretty cool here. Uh, let's see. That's the wrong one. I guess you're not seeing that. Nope. I, I shared the wrong thing. So let's try. Oh, Acrobat. That's what I need to share. Here we go. So this is the figure kind of summarizes what they did. They split it up the whole cycle into different parts. You know, they, they have, for example, um, and here in this figure, the blue boxes are data, actual data that they can collect. So they can look at the seropositivity of the host. You have a bunch of mammals here and a bunch of different mosquitoes. Uh, host seropositivity, the abundance of the hosts. Like how many are the, of horses or kangaroos or people are we talking about? Uh, the, the proportion of the host that's viremic, the, the mosquito abundance, um, they also measure the, the viremia in the mosquito besides the uh, the host. And then the the, the red boxes are, are estimates, mosquito survival, mosquito biting rate, mosquitoes per host. And then the black boxes are where we are out of our lane. These are statistical <laughs> models that are used to pre predict the biting preference of a mosquito, transmission probability, tighter profiles, viruses in each mosquito, mosquito infection probability given a host titer. So you need a certain amount of virus in the blood for it to get into a mosquito and then that mosquito to transfer it to somewhere else. The preference of, of biting of each mosquito, we don't know all of that. 
All right, so those are the different parameters that they use and they study. What they is break. that person doing? He's digging. He's digging. He's, a, he's digging, probably planting, yeah. right? He's He's got a little trowel there, I think. Yeah. And, uh, um, and it, go ahead. I was just going to say, before you take this figure away, it, it occurred to me that this is a very human-centric or mammalian-centric view of yeah. what yeah. is the host and what is the vector. You know, you could think of it as the mosquitoes are really the host and all these other animals are the vectors. It's just that. Uh, yeah, that, I, yeah. Kathy, that's brilliant. We've named I it hadn't that really way. thought about that. We always talk about the, the mosquitoes as the vector. If you're a mosquito, uh, it's a different story. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I like that. And um, there are also birds involved, right? And they're, mm -hmm. they're not mm -hmm. shown yep. on either. They left the birds out of this picture. Yeah. They also split up. You know, there's a cycle where a mosquito bites a host and then takes virus to another host and another mosquito bites. So there's a whole cycle. They divide it into vector to host transmission and then host to vector. And they study that separately from the whole cycle. So that's the overall view of this. They have a little bit of data and they, they make models which... Hey, I'll show you the methods section in the Zoom here. You can see why this is out of our lane. Look at this. Where, where, this, where is this thing? <laughs> and I know we're going to get people writing and saying, oh, you could figure that out. Uh, where is it? Here. There you go. See that? Oh, equations. Math. <laughs> see, yeah, it's got a lot of alpha, beta, delta, gammas in it, you know. Um, anyway. So that's anytime I see one of those sum signs, I just short out. You don't like the sums, <laughs> huh? No. Um, so we got to, where's I wanted to just briefly tell you the methods here for some of the things where they do collect data because it's it's uh it's virology. Let me go to okay. Uh so tight they do vertebrate host virus titers, so they can measure. Uh, they take blood from hosts who have been bitten. Uh, this is experimentally, and they can titrate their virus um, in a plaque assay. They use Vero cells um, to do plaque assays, and they can get both human and non-human blood virus titers. So that's one of the data points that they use. They also have mosquito infection and transmission of Mosquitoes, you can have mosquitoes take a blood meal of, of blood that has virus in it and see how well it reproduces in the mosquito to get an idea of what we call vector competence, how, how high the, the virus reproduces to in a mosquito. And you can use uh, mice to allow them to be bitten by the mosquito and see how well that they transmit. So those are experiments that were done and, and incorporated into this. Um, I think feeding behavior of the mosquito is is a modeled part of this of the data here. You know, what kind of hosts do they prefer? I think there's a little bit of observation. You know, if you take blood from a mosquito, you can kind of you sort of figure out what host it has bitten recently by the the blood that's in it, and that's been published in the in the they call that blood meal data. Uh, humans or some other kind of animal there. Um, I think those are the main sources of data here. I think uh, they have zero surveys, don't they? And they have serological surveys, yeah. Okay, to get an idea of what the zero prevalence is in nature. And of course, then they have uh, population estimates for the mosquitoes, the different species of mosquitoes, population estimates for the horses, the birds, the humans that are in different areas, right? Because that's important for, for modeling if the likelihood that a mosquito would find a particular yes. host, right? If Ecological not, considerations, do these yes. uh, niches overlap? Yeah, humans, birds, there's a figure here looking at the density distribution uh, from which they can then predict the kind of transmission patterns that are, are going on. And so they make these models that approximate that, and then they carry their models through multiple cycles, right? They say, okay, if the mosquito bites this animal, that's half the cycle, then the animal is bitten by another one, and it completes the cycle. And then they repeat that for 
multiple cycles and and model what happens. Okay, so that's that's the kind of uh, approach that they're using here. So, for example, um, they the paper is set up to um, look at half transmission cycles and then full transmission cycles. And there are lots of different mosquito uh, species that are involved here. And they can they estimate. And, and this is for Brisbane, right? They want to estimate the, the most prevalent mosquitoes and how well they reproduce the virus and basically assign a potential for uh, transmission. Uh, for example, um, we predict that an infected human would predominantly infect three different species of mosquitoes in, in ranked order, one being more likely uh, than another. Um, and then they say rats and macropods, which have the highest physiological potential for transmission, they drop beneath possums, bird, and horses um, because there are fewer of them and they're less likely to be infected. Macropods um, being, I had to look it up, can <laughs> kangaroos and wallabies. Kangaroos and yep. wallabies, macropods, right? Um, and then some animals are not really good hosts for the virus, so they drop further uh, horses had one of the lowest estimated viremic responses, but they increase in important because there are a lot of them and they're near people. Whereas cats and dogs don't trans, they don't make, they don't get viremia. So they're out of the picture. <laughs> I really like the, uh, yeah, I really like the uh, dog part of this because dogs are what we call in this sort of thing, a dead end host. That is, they can be bitten but they don't uh, transmit the virus. That's right. Uh, That's and right. so they actually, uh, in part of this discussion, the dogs figure in as sort of a sponge. That's right. Because yes. mosquitoes, right. mosquitoes typically only take one blood meal, right? In yeah. the, yeah, one or uh, two, in the yeah. course of their life cycle. So if they, if, they, they, if they throw away their shot, as it were, on a dog, okay, it takes them out of the picture. Yes. Right. They, they use the term sink. Sink. Uh, yes. S-I-N-K, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's good. Good. Um, then they look at vector to host transmission. Um, so, for example, one, one of these mosquitoes would mostly infect birds, but some of the others would infect a larger diversity of species. So more, you know, in their models, they're going to play a bigger role because they're generalist mosquitoes, I guess. Then they do the complete transmission cycle. They calculate the number of second generation hosts a, a particular host would infect. And this is pretty complicated predictions. Um, and then what mosquitoes prefer to bite what hosts and the likelihood of transmission. And then um, when they do host vector host, which is the complete cycle, uh, humans, birds, possums, horses, and macro macropods remain in the top cluster of hosts. So those are the, what they think are the most important hosts for the, the maintenance of this virus uh, in, in the ecology. Despite wide um, overlap of humans with birds, possums, horses, and macropods, um, much of the density distribution for humans falls above that of other species. So humans are a big driver of uh, the propagation, which may not be something you would think about, right? You would think maybe the animals in the woods, their fault, but it's not. Um, we estimate that mosquitoes that acquire the virus from humans mostly go on to infect humans and then birds and then dogs, which would be the sink, and then possums, <laughs> which, which is all calculated by the numbers of these animals, what mosquitoes bite them, how much they interact, uh, and so forth, right? All of the ecology. Uh, we predict an infected bird, the species with the second highest estimated median of virus, would primarily infect other birds, followed by dogs and humans. Why? Because birds mainly hang out with birds, right? <laughs> so, and mosquitoes like to bite birds. Um, they're great hosts for mosquitoes. They get, they can sense them by their carbon dioxide gradient, and th so they bite them, and then they bite other birds. Yeah. Um, so those are kind of examples of uh, what they do. Then they do the multiple uh, generations. 
um, uh, in their model. They say infections tend to propagate through humans, birds, dogs, and horses. And as Rich said, wasted transmissions from birth, both humans and birds to dogs, a dead end host. They do some they do some modeling where you begin an infection in a rare species, and they say uh, that after a single generation, then you're going to have a particular kind of mosquito that prefers them uh, to move on. But those mosquitoes may be rare in Brisbane, so they're not going to propagate the infection. So you, you can see how all of this information plays an aggregate role, and that's how their models are are, are um, assembled. All right, so those, that's an overview. So let me see if I can uh, summarize that. Okay, so our results corroborate some of, some of what we knew already, but we have some surprising results. Um, we know that macropods are really good hosts for, for the virus. Cats and dogs have never been considered to play a role, and that's supported by this work. In contrast, horses, uh, which occasionally develop high viremia, have been considered a modestly competent host, have low physiologic competence on average because less than 15% of exposed horses develop viremia when infected. Humans, which have not been considered important for local transmission, had a moderate to high physiological competence uh, following infection. And as we mentioned earlier, the virus has long been considered a generalist our results that no single species was dominant in its physiological competence supports this view. So they say, if you just look at physiological competence of a host, you get an incomplete picture of transmission. For example, a host's competence is of little importance if that host is rare or adopts feeding behavior that prevents exposure. And mosquito feeding preference can drive transmission more strongly than host competence. These are all things that play into how um, this this virus transmits. Yeah. So so when I look at it, the I look at there's a figure one A actually that just shows you kind of how well the virus reproduces in different species. And if I looked at that, I would say, oh my gosh, we need to study this virus in rats. Mm -hmm. um, because there's so much of this virus in rats. And then yeah. if you listen to everything else that we just said in terms of actually thinking about the mosquitoes and transmission, you never heard the mention of the word rats. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, and so that tells you that rats probably aren't actually the thing we should study the most. Yeah, that's right. Um, that's and right. other things that, that sort of don't look very important in that figure like horses um, are a much bigger deal. Uh, and so it sort of tells us that you can't just look at one piece of this. Um, you need all of these pieces. So one of the bottom lines here is that humans are really important for, for transmission of Ross River virus. And they also identify specific mosquitoes uh, that may be good targets to reduce. Um, and they, they do say that some of the mosquitoes they have identified are actually targets of um, of uh, what do you call it? extinction in Brisbane. They have uh, mosquito reduction programs and you can target certain mosquitoes. I don't know how you would do that, but uh, some of the mosquitoes they identify as important are, are being targeted in Brisbane, which is- this, uh, Yeah, one. it's Aedes vigilax. Right. But, uh, this uh, importance of humans, again, if you think about my saying that the, the diagram maybe should be flipped um, maybe humans are the good vector and, and the mosquitoes are the host. Right, <laughs> Just right. another way of thinking of that. Um, the vectors identified in the Brisbane cycle, Aedes vigilax, Procax, and uh, CQ. What is CQ? Uh, Culex quina, quinca fasciaticus. But it's Q, CQ linealis. So the CQ is this species, oh. genus. Anyway, they're recognized as important vectors. They're regularly targeted in control programs. However, we predicted that Culex annuli rostris and Aedes notoscriptus are less competent vectors, although they are often cited as key Ross River viruses vectors in Brisbane. Um, this suggests a new hypothesis that Culex annuli rostris and Aedes notoscriptus are secondary vectors. Uh, capable of playing a supplemental role. 
And then finally, the isolation of the virus from wild caught mosquitoes demonstrates that a particular species is infected, but is incomplete evidence for that species role in transmission. Even if found infected in the field, the lower transmission capability of Culex annulo rostris or Aedes notoscriptus relative to Aedes vigilax, et cetera, means that the former are likely to transmit infection to fewer hosts than the latter. All right, so that gives that's a picture, right? It's multifactorial. You have to consider all aspects of these complicated cycles, how many animals, where they are, who they interact with, what kind of mosquitoes bite them, how much viremia the mosquito and the animal gets, vector competence. That's why you need math. <laughs> right? CQ is coculitidia. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think it's I think it's coquitidia. Because that sounds be much nicer. It's like, like French, like coquille Saint Jacques. Coquia tidia. That's yep. my guess. I'll Coquia go with that. Coquia tidia linealis. Wow. I never I heard about right Coquia time, tidia. Huh? That's nope. interesting. That's a new one. Yeah. And the, Alan would tell you how many genera of mosquitoes there are. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what's the Cinqua facialis? What was the genus of that that's, one? That's a Culex. Culex. That's one of the West Nile vectors, right? Yeah. It is. So West Nile, they cite in the um, <laughs> they cite in the introduction as one of these uh, viruses with a complicated uh, interconnected network, right? They bite lots of birds and also rodents of various sorts and and people. Hard to sort out. I'd like to know how this virus does this. You know, given the really high species barriers in a number of other viruses, indicating that species do tend to mount very specific barriers to various viruses. This virus has broken all that down. It's an RNA virus, man. How many, Unbelievable. How many DNA what's the virus? receptor? <laughs> Maybe more than one. How Good many point. DNA viruses are arthropod born, Rich? One? What's the, which, uh, one that we African know swine that we, fever. African swine fever, right? Uh, Myxoma. That's right. Myxoma is the oh. other one. Yeah, yeah. The one, the rab, the rabbit one is transmitted by mosquitoes. And, yeah. But Myxoma, that's a mechanical transmission. It doesn't replicate oh, okay. in, the, uh, in in the vector. But the swine African, African swine, swine, swine fever. fever does. So I think it's a reflection of the population diversity, right? That the RNA oh. viruses have bit much bigger quasi species, and they're able to be generalists. That's what I would guess. But. Um, we don't know. It's fascinating. So that's why I, I pick this because I think this idea of all these factors being in, needed, needing to be considered, we don't do very often. And this paper did it, and I'm very uh, impressed that they took this on. <laughs> Can you imagine? Student comes to your lab. What are you, no. you going to work on? Well, you're going to figure out what all these animals and mosquitoes do. And you know, there are not a lot of uh, authors on this paper. They're not, it's not huge. One, two, three, four, five authors. And two co-first authors. Good for you. Good for you. Okay, out of our lane. That's a good one. <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> Kathy has pasted in this the uh, sum figure. <laughs> for I use uh, it in my notes a lot when I'm trying to summarize something. Yeah, so it's a good Rich said point. he's afraid of the sigma symbol, but but I use it. <laughs> yeah, well, but I, I discovered yeah. it seems like. Uh, Google Docs don't have symbol font. I, I couldn't use a symbol font. How'd you do that? How'd you paste that? I in? went to some place, made an image, and pasted the image. Yeah. <laughs> I see. Okay. Where there's a will, there's a way. I wanted to do it. <laughs> All right. Um, 3.30. Hmm. You guys feel like doing a round of letters? Are you up for sure. it? Sure. Just one round. One round. All right. Uh, Rich, can you take the first one? Sam writes, TWIV. I'm writing, seeking advice to address many of the vaccine concerns I have heard. I work as a nurse in an intensive care unit, and my hospital has recently announced that they will mandate vaccination to maintain employment within the hospital. I personally fully support this decision, but I have many coworkers that are very against it, despite taking care of COVID-19 patients firsthand. This blows my mind. 
I have had many people come to me seeking my opinion about why they should get vaccination as I have been very involved in vaccination clinics for the community and am the only nurse with a microbiology background. I was wondering if you had any input on how to address the most common question of why should I get uh, the vaccine if vaccinated healthcare workers are still getting the virus, virus or shedding virus. Typically, my answer to vaccination has been, it is your ethical responsibility as a healthcare worker to protect the vulnerable population you work with. However, in this case, there uh, are data showing you, you are possibly shedding virus, like this new paper from the CDC resulting in a change in guidelines. How do you respond? I've been saying that at least in other variants studies, have in other variants, studies have shown a decrease in viral load. Thinking of the papers in Israel you talked about early in the vaccination process. So you should shed less virus depending on what strain you pick up and prepare for the booster to come as things develop. I'm wondering if you have a better answer that might help address this concern. Many people feel that despite being a healthcare worker, vaccination is a personal choice and they are only risking their own life Thank you, Sam. Okay, so I have a couple of answers to this, and uh, I'm sure others on the podcast do as well. One is relevant to the uh, my pick for the week that I will come to, and that is, uh, first of all, forget everything you've heard about herd immunity. In the long run, uh, the pandemic is going to end when the vast majority of the population is immune to the virus in some fashion, everybody in, in, uh, in the long run, as with the common cold virus is going to mount an immune response to this virus, 90% of the population. And there'll be newborns who are in, in the line to become immune. So everybody's going to be immune somehow. There are two ways to get immune. One is to get infected. The other is to get vaccinated. There is an infinitesimally small risk of a bad outcome from a vaccination. There's a huge risk of a bad outcome from getting infected. So take your choice. Okay. You're going to be immune somehow. You're either going to get infected or you're going to get vaccinated. There's virtually no risk from being vaccinated. There's a huge risk from getting infected. What are you going to do? Make your choice. The choice is yours. Okay? Get vaccinated. It's stupid not to. I'm sorry, but it's stupid not to get vaccinated. Uh, the other is that I do uh, uh, agree that as a healthcare worker, you have a responsibility not to spread the virus around. And from everything we know, the probability that you are going to spread virus around is decreased if you're vaccinated. It's not zero but it's decreased and you have a responsibility. It blows my mind that people who are exposed won't, uh, w- are willing to take the risk of exposure first and second are willing to uh, expose their patients to their disease. Um, it makes no sense to me at all. Okay. So protect yourself, protect your patients. And there's no downside. There's no downside. I, I- yeah. I was going to say that, you know, the study that uh, showed that the for at least a brief window of time, there may be equivalent viral RNA levels from vaccinated and unvaccinated people is what I think has really accelerated this type of thinking. Um, but I, I think it's very clear that it's a very short window of time for which those RNA levels are the same. And they don't necessarily tell you something about infectious virus levels. And so I, I think that's important. And, you know, there's lots of things that we do in society that protect others. Um, you know, uh, not driving drunk, for example, um, even behaving traffic signals, stop signs and stop lights and things like that. Um, And when we don't, that causes problems. And so I don't know if you can make some kind of analogy 
that would help your healthcare worker colleagues to see it that way. Um, that that might be an answer. I don't understand why they don't want to be vaccinated. Well, I guess I'm told it's about my personal choice. I want to choose. I, I don't get it. Why you wouldn't choose to protect yeah. others, right? <laughs> well, right. plus right. the smart choice is to get vaccinated. This last sentence is really revealing. Uh, they feel it's a personal choice and they are only risking their own life. No, You're not no. risking your life by getting vaccinated. You're risking your life by not getting vaccinated. Right. Okay. It's backwards thinking. Well, and to, to do the traffic analogy, you could be risking your life if you run stop lines, lights or stop right. signs, you know, and you are also protecting others if you obey them. So, yeah, it boggles the, the mind. Um, I th the science uh, in this pandemic has been interesting because things happen quickly and they're not fully baked. It takes time for science to come to some resolution, right? So they do the Provincetown study. You get these RNA viral loads and who knows what it means? You need to wait for more work and people are working on it and, we, and there are a lot of preprints. And to base policy on it is really hard. And then people get confused because they don't know what to make of it. You know, most research is done in the, in the quiet. Nobody hears about it until, until it's fully resolved. So this is an unusual situation and it makes it really, really challenging. Um, I, I was, I talked to a reporter last week who wanted to know why some police departments were rebelling against vaccine mandates. <laughs> I said, well, I don't know, but it seems to me that their job is to protect people. And if they're going to infect people, that's not part of it, right? By not being vaccinated, it seems like a crazy thing, but um, there you have it. Well, I really, uh, I want to reemphasize because I really think that put in, the, I was impressed with this thing that I will pick yep. at the end, that you can actually reduce it to a binary choice. People like this. They like black and white stuff. They don't like the nuance. You can reduce it to a binary choice. You have a choice. Either get vaccinated or get infected. That's and right. And the probability that you're going to have a really lousy outcome if you get infected is high. The probability that you're going to have a bad outcome if you get vaccinated is near zero. Okay? So, it's easy. It's an easy choice. Mm -hmm. And you have to make the choice. If you talk about personal choice, that's your choice. Get vaccinated or get infected. Which do you want? It's a no-brainer. All right, Brianne, can you take the next one? Sure. Christina writes, good afternoon to a team. In suburban Dallas, where I live, it is currently 89 at Fahrenheit, 32 Celsius with 52% humidity. This is stunningly mild weather for Texas in August. Thank you for all of the information you provide and your efforts to define terms and phenomena for listeners like me who are not scientists or healthcare providers. My husband still chuckles when I say the plural of anecdote is not data. <laughs> I like it. This time I am one with a little extra information, specifically pertaining to Bistra's letter read on episode 788. He is a good friend who seeks out accurate information to support his friend's decision making. Full disclosure, I am not a doctor, nor do I play one on TV. The comments following are in no way intended as a substitute for professional medical advice. That said, I have lived with an autoimmune disease for 21 years. Over that time, I have learned the value of educating myself on my diagnoses and medications in an effort to become the best expert I can possibly be on my own health. Listening to TWIV is currently part of that. So has lurking about the website of the American College of Rheumatology, the major U.S. professional organization for the kind of specialists who treat most autoimmune diseases. Among other things, their website, rheumatology.org, includes access to the recordings of town hall webinars on topics related to COVID-19 and autoimmune disease, the vaccine clinical guidance summary developed by the ACR task force, and a patient resource document with an abundance of helpful links that they have vetted for accuracy. Here is the link to that patient-focused document in the hope that it will provide Bistra it will help provide help Bistra provide accurate information to his friends in Bulgaria. And she gives a link. Spoiler alert. The official stance of the American College of Rheumatologists is very much in favor of vaccination, although they acknowledge the decision ultimately belongs to the patient and physician. 
They do suggest tips on the timing of vaccination relative to certain medications that may help maximize the immune response. Many of the links on that patient resource document lead to the patient-focused website, creakyjoints.org. <laughs> interested parties can register for this site's COVID-19 support email updates, which I have found very helpful in providing pandemic information specifically tailored to those with autoimmune diseases and their caregivers. All of that probably counts as a listener pick, but I have one more if time permits or you need one for a future episode. This pick dovetails with Alan's earlier LibriVox pick and Brianne's pick of the article about scientists needing to read more fiction. Craftlit.com provides annotated audiobooks, which really boils down to a sort of virtual audio book club delivered by a, by a weekly podcast. The podcast host, Heather Ordover, chooses classic fiction in the public domain, mostly from LibriVox recordings, and invests many hours of research behind the scenes on tricky vocabulary, author background, and cultural references we no longer understand. Each episode consists of some crafty or creative talk up front and one or two chapters of the current book with helpful commentary by Heather before and after. In the 14 years of this podcast, listeners like me have experienced books ranging from Little Women and Anne of Green Gables to The Count of Monte Cristo and Frankenstein to Jane Eyre and Sense and Sensibility. Heather is the English teacher we all wish we had, but her most recent job was not teaching literature, but training contact tracers for her state's pandemic response. In fact, she is the one who alerted me to TWIV. So it seems only fitting that I suggest mm. Heather and Craftlit as a listener pick. As she likes to say, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. Mm -hmm. Thanks again for all you do to help listeners understand the real facts and data behind the headlines and misinformation. Gratefully, Christina. Um, thank you, Christina. I will be checking out that podcast right away. Uh, sounds great. Excellent. I love creakyjoints.org. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> wow. Thank you, Christina. Kathy. David writes, it is currently 68 degrees here in Redmond, Washington, which doesn't sound too bad, but that's because it's nearly three in the morning <laughs> and it's expected that we will be near or above 100 at the highs for the next couple days. That's in fact the main reason I'm asking this question. For context, where I am, we have 81.9% of the eligible population having started vaccination and 76 complete, and all of my immediate family and I are fully vaccinated. The recommendation in my county currently is that fully vaccinated people should consider wearing a mask in indoor public areas. The issue at this specific juncture is that I sweat bullets in 100 degree heat, even without a mask trapping all the heat and humidity of my breath to my face. So a side note here, I think this must be from maybe around June. Uh, so it's a while back um, because that's when it was really hot in Washington. To be clear, I'm not at all anti-mask and I wear mine without complaint in scenarios where it is mandated, but in other scenarios where I'm only supposed to consider masking, I admit I have a hard time coming up with reasons why I should make myself even more hot and uncomfortable. In those scenarios, I rarely am in prolonged close contact with anyone. And in those rare circumstances where I am, it's with other people who I know are also fully vaccinated. My understanding is that the evidence for easier transmission from vaccinated people for the Delta variant compared to other variants is inconclusive at most. For example, the Singapore paper you've talked about recently. And while yes, I could be infected even after vaccination, my understanding is that the mask isn't offering me that much additional protection from some hypothetical droplet somehow floating in the air for the medium to long term that contains SARS-CoV-2 anyway, which I understand to be considered a pretty low risk scenario. And as I am fully vaccinated, the chances of infection if I do run into this hypothetical droplet are low. And even if it did happen, the chance of serious symptoms, hospitalization or death are way lower still. The way I've been thinking about this is that for a fully vaccinated individual, it doesn't seem that much more dangerous than the dangers of any other respiratory illness. And I never wore a mask before to stop the common cold or the flu. If that's a mistaken thought, please correct it. There's rarely even any unvaccinated person within eyesight to whom my masking could exert social pressure for them to mask. I'd have no issue making myself more miserable from the heat in those scenarios if I knew there, was, there were good reasons that doing so was more than hygiene theater. But as it stands, when I, quote, consider the question, I struggle to come up with any and would appreciate any input any of you would have 
on this question. Thanks, David. So uh, he's mostly saying that um, he's resisting considering wearing a mask in public indoor areas when it's really hot. And um, I guess one counter to that is that if it's indoors, uh, in many places, it will be air conditioned. That may not be the case always in Redmond and in other parts of the world. Um, and, you know, the guidance has somewhat changed uh, in the intervening time, I think during the month of July, that um, indoors, it's probably a good idea to wear masks. Uh, if anything, as always, you know, it's 80% to protect other people and 20% to protect yourself. And so for all the reasons that you describe, if you're not around other people and you're indoors and so forth, then yeah, you can still quote, consider wearing a mask. But uh, in those situations, I think where you're around a lot of people, I would more highly consider wearing a mask. I don't know. What do you guys think? So what is the, what is the logic? I mean, he's right that we're not sure if, vaccinated people are able to transmit Delta if they're infected, right? You're going to get infected, it will reproduce a little bit, but probably decline very rapidly. We don't know if it transmits, right? So are we protecting ourselves from a moderate infection or or are we trying to cut down transmission? I, I'm really confused myself because I, I think the science isn't there yet, right? Yeah, so there was a classroom uh, study in MMWR last week um, that I looked at and found somewhat terrifying. Um, and at least in that study, um, the masks seemed to do a lot to prevent transmission um, from the infected person more so yeah, than yeah. acquisition. Um, so in that way, I think about them as preventing transmission that really highlighted uh, those data for me. Um, and I, you know, I think that my understanding is that part of this is also related to the uh, infection numbers in your area. The CDC um, recommendations are partially based on how many infections are in your area. Um, and are you in a yeah. substantial or high transmission risk? And that, so I think that that's one thing David doesn't mention that would be part of my calculation. The uh, transmission study you mentioned was in among unvaccinated students, I presume, right? Uh, no, uh, they were, un it, I don't think they, they were reported, old enough. but I think they weren't old enough, but they yeah. were all masked. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, unvaccinated individuals, I think it, it's quite clear, right? I think CDC is erring on the side of caution by having everyone, even vaccinated people wear masks, right? Because maybe we uh, don't in know. Yeah, in particular, because when they said you can take off your masks, everything blew up. Right. Okay, so uh, I um, I want to tell you how I personally think about this because yep. yep. we're dealing with this in Austin and I'm uh, on the safety committee for our chorus. Okay, <laughs> so I think about this all the time. Um, I would refer anyone to the New York Times uh, site that is tracking coronavirus. Look up something like New York Times mm -hmm. COVID tracking. And I, I can't give you the the base link. You have to uh, look around. Okay. I probably, uh, I'll, I'll look it up. We can stick it in the show notes. Um, and uh, there is a subdomain of that where you can look into individual counties. And you can drill down into your individual county. And essentially, it's it's remarkable. This is a great site. You can find out what the virus load is in your county mm -hmm. by several different metrics, okay? The metric that I like the best is hospitalized COVID patients uh, because that's a really good measure of how much virus is going around. And if you look right now at the hospitalized COVID ca uh, patients in the King County area, which is where Redmond is, it is as high and I think maybe even a little higher than the absolute peak of the pandemic in uh, late December, early January. So right now in King County, even with a high vaccination rate and et cetera, uh, by the way I read this, 
COVID is raging. Okay. Under those circumstances, my opinion is that I have a responsibility as a member of the community. And okay. Also in my mind, this is all behavior driven. Forget about variants. Okay. Whether or not we have COVID raging has everything to do with how we behave. Okay. Good on you. You got a high vaccination rate, but something's going on because the virus is spreading around. Okay. So the only other tools we have really are masking and distancing. And personally, I feel a responsibility um, as a member of the community to do my part to limit the transmission and bring this down. Okay. So under the circumstances where a lot of people are in the hospital and you're, you're peeking on this, I feel a responsibility to wear a mask because uh, I may, I may contribute to this. And, you know, even further than that, uh, maybe I can influence some other people to do the same thing by my own behavior. It's not a big deal. Uh, the right now in Travis County, we're in, uh, what I don't see in King County is where you might look at the department of public health and see if they have specific recommendations, but in a similar situation right now in Travis County, the uh, guidelines are for both vaccinated and unvaccinated people to wear masks indoors or outdoors. I'm going to a rehearsal tonight. That's an in-person rehearsal. And we're going to sing in a parking garage wearing masks. So outdoors wearing masks. Yeah. I think that's a good approach. I mean, I, I always wear masks as well, but I just have a, I have trouble explaining to people because we're not sure if a vaccinated person can transmit, but just to be cautious, let's wear masks until we find out. By the way, I just loaded up the New York Times site and looking at uh, Nebraska is no longer reporting data of all the states. Nebraska isn't reporting it. Can you imagine? This is public health, folks, not politics. Unbelievable. All right. Last one from Amelia. Hello, Twiv. The latest argument I've heard from some anti-vax friends and family is that vaccination causes the virus to evolve into a more virulent form. <laughs> of course, this is coming mostly from people who don't believe in evolution anyway. So I don't think they are arguing in good faith here. Of course they aren't, but it doesn't stop them, does it? But they did share a journal article. Ah, the famous Andy Reid paper, Imperfect Vaccination Can Enhance the Transmission of Highly Virulent Pathogens. We did this on TWIV a long time ago. Marek's disease uh, vaccine for chickens. In this work, they show that leaky vaccines result in increased virulence. Leaky is such a wrong term. It results in increased virulence among the unvaccinated using chickens and Marek's disease virus. It's commonly reported in the news, especially, quote, news, unquote, consumed by anti-vaxxers that the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines do not prevent vaccinated people from getting infected and transmitting the virus to others. The authors also claim that most human vaccines are sterilizing. In discussions about the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, I've heard claims that it's remarkable that they do reduce infection and transmission. Questions here. One, are human vaccines usually able to prevent infection and transmission as well as disease? So as we have said multiple times, most human vaccines do not prevent infection. My sense is that I, this has been not very much studied whether they allow transmission or not, but I think they reduce shedding sufficiently to markedly inhibit transmission. And that's why we see the effects of herd immunity. Otherwise we would not. So most human vaccines do not prevent infection. They allow infection as Ron Fouché even talked about for influenza virus. Um, so one of the vaccines that people sometimes will start to talk about here is measles and whether or not measles yeah. um, blocks infection. Uh, I'm pulling it up right now because there has been, uh, there have been some recent, uh, conversations about this on Twitter. And there is in fact a paper that everyone is citing that actually shows measles uh, positivity in, in uh, vaccinated individuals, but it's infection and not disease. Of course, it, it, it depends when you check people. If you do, if you vaccinate people and then a month later look for prevention of infection, you will see it because they have high levels of antibodies. But if you wait eight months, 
when the serum antibodies decline, then you won't see prevention against infection, which is the pattern we saw with SARS-CoV-2, right? So when in the, in the course of the, of the vaccination you do that is really important. Um, so that's one. Number two, what is the potential for the current SARS-CoV-2 vaccines to enhance the transmission of highly virulent pathogens? So I, I think transmission is a highly selectable feature. If you have a virus which is poorly transmissible in a particular host population, a variant that randomly emerges through quasi-species, through random mutation of the genome, could be selected uh, as more transmissible. But I think there has to be some selection for it, and there usually is for better transmission. Now, um, I don't understand why a vaccine would enhance transmission per se, unless a, a let's say, not just a vaccine, but any kind of immunity, whether it's conferred by a vaccine or natural infection, would put antigenic pressure on the virus. And then some variant could emerge that, say, escapes immunity to some extent. And as a corollary, maybe that same change could enhance transmission. So in other words, the virus is already quite transmissible, but this change, which was selected by another property, could have led to uh, enhanced transmission just by chance. So it's possible, not just vaccines though. I think any kind of immunity could could do that. Um, I'm not convinced that we have seen it yet for SARS-CoV-2 and we have vaccinated and infected many, many millions of people. So, I mean, the, the Marek study, when we did that, I thought the data we're not conclusive showing that. So the vaccine doesn't prevent infection, basically. So the virus can move through chickens and the, the claim was that it was becoming more virulent as a consequence. I don't think that there was uh, evidence for that. So the potential for this current vaccines to enhance transmission, I think is quite low. Uh, three, is this issue considered when a new vaccine is developed and released? No, what, what a new vaccine is developed for is to prevent disease first in animal models in the laboratory, uh, and then in humans in, in trials. Prevent disease, it is not tested to prevent infection. That's a very high barrier to overcome. And especially since immune levels, antibodies, T cells, whatever you're thinking about, decline, and we're left with memory. That's the way the immune system works, and you're not going to prevent, in most cases, infection. So we develop vaccines to prevent uh, serious disease. So to use this paper as a reason not to get vaccinated is quite disingenuous, but that is not a, a characteristic that these individuals care about anyway. Of course, in the end, one solution is just to get vaccinated if you can. I'm still impatiently waiting for vaccine authorization for my toddler and encouraging everyone I know to get vaccinated. Thank you for keeping us informed, Amelia. Just get vaccinated, as Rich said. <laughs> I mean, you can do all kinds of mental gymnastics and find any paper you want, but there's no downside to getting vaccinated. And if you think it's your right to choose, okay, just choose to get vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs> why not? I don't know why you wouldn't do that. All right, do so it for yourself. Let's see. Do this, it for uh, yourself. Brienne has pasted in a... I have pasted in the here. link that has been getting quite a lot of discussion as the example that even measles does not give you, the measles vaccine does not always give you sterilizing immunity. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think that's, that's, yeah, it allows infection. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, I pasted in here right above the email mm -hmm. below uh, Kathy's little sum sign, the New York Times site. Okay. That's uh, titled Coronavirus in the U.S. Latest Map and Case Count. You have to scroll down on that to get the county trends. And when you get to your county, it just gives you a one-line summary, but you can click on the county and that gives you inside the county all sorts of data, okay? So this is a wonderful resource. I'm uh, really yeah, it's good. grateful for these guys for doing this because it's all very accessible. All right, let's do some picks. Brian, what do you have for us? Um, I have something that uh, made me think of everyone's enjoyment of plaque assays and other 
uh, virology techniques. Um, so this is an article called this microscopic video shows the coronavirus on a rampage. Um, if I was pedantic, I would say the video is not microscopic. <laughs> You're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so this is a, a video of SARS-CoV-2 infecting um, cells. Uh, specifically, these are uh, some bat cells um, where you can actually watch uh, the virus killing the cells. Um, this was part of a video competition from Nikon. Um, and it, one honorable mention, I know we've talked about different photography competitions before, um, and it's just amazing to watch this time lapse of this monolayer of cells um, being uh, pretty well destroyed by this virus. Yeah, it's just like the the video of the plaque assay, right? Yeah. <laughs> and yep. we, we waxed about that years ago and people said, oh... You're you're such geeks, and now it's in the New York Times. A similar but look how cool it is. It's great. <laughs> we always thought it was great, and now people are getting it. Right? It's fine. Uh, so, what's the red here? Um, so the red is. Let me see it. Uh, the red is actually a dying cell. Okay, so that's apoptosis or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Okay, so you're not actually seeing virus. You're seeing the cells die. Right. Exactly. This is uh, uh, for your toy folks out there, you hear us talk about cytopathic effect. That's what this is. Cyto, like cell, patho, not good. <laughs> cytopathic <laughs> effect. Yeah, even pathos is not good. Kathy, what do you have for us? I have something that a science writer found for me. She interviewed me a while back and I talked about um, how I can, and you've maybe heard me say it, how I can remember which polio vaccine is the oral one because in, uh, I grew up in a suburb of Cleveland, which is in Cuyahoga County. Um, in 1962, the vaccine campaign was called Sabin Oral Sundays. And so I've always remembered that. And that's how I can remember Sabin is the oral vaccine. And so she picked up on that and found this brochure that was given out at the time in Cuyahoga County. Uh, questions and answers about Saban Oral Sundays. And it tells about, um, you know, on two Sundays, you get uh, type one uh, vaccine and uh, just all about it. And it's just was really cool. Uh, I was really grateful that she found it. And it's just interesting to see how a vaccine campaign was carried out in 1962, at least uh, with respect to this uh, area of Cleveland and the, and the, Save an Oral Sundays brochure. Very clever. Save an Oral Sundays is SOS. Yes. Right? yes. Yes. Good boy. I wish Saban were around. He'd be ripping into people who don't want to be vaccinated. He'd be in <sighs> all the newspapers. He'd be on TV. Oh, he was such a character. Yeah. Rich, what do you have for us? Uh, I'll be quick. This uh, was brought to my attention by my wife, Ibby, and I've mentioned it several times. This is a, a lecture on uh that was has been posted on youtube uh by gregory poland who is a vaccinologist at the mayo clinic he's sort of a viral immunologist slash vaccine guy also the editor editor-in-chief of the uh, journal vaccine uh and it was you know a grand rounds really uh that's about uh, the lecture itself is probably only 40, 45 minutes long. There's a lot of questions and answers uh, that are uh, worth uh, looking at. And uh, he's very direct, very blunt, very clear. And I really appreciate it. And that's where, you know, I'm, I'm really impressed with this bottom line. Okay. You're going to become immune somehow. Okay. Either by getting infected with the virus or by getting vaccinated. And there's a huge downside to getting infected and virtually no downside to uh, uh, getting vaccinated. So make your choice. That's, if you talk about personal choice, that's your choice. Cool. Very good. Uh, my pick is a Times article called Demand Surges for Deworming Drug for COVID Despite Scant Evidence It Works. People want ivermectin. Prescriptions have gone to... 88,000 a week, and people are taking veterinary ivermectin. They're overdosing. Folks, these are the same folks that don't want to get vaccinated because they fear long-term effects. Yeah, you think you're not going to have a long-term effects from a drug that binds a channel in your brain? Oh, my gosh. There's scant evidence that 
uh, ivermectin is, has any effect. However, many people say, oh, the big pharma is hiding it. Really? It's made by big pharma. They would love for you to buy it if they thought it worked. Anyway, um, the veterinary ivermectin is more concentrated and that can be dangerous for people. I also got a, an email the other day from uh, Auburn University Extension. Um, ivermectin for animals, not safe for people. Farm supply and feed stores cannot keep a livestock deworming medication on the shelves because social media posts are calling it a cure for COVID. And it goes on to say why this is not for people. This is crazy, folks. Get vaccinated. It's way safer than overdosing on uh, ivermectin. Oh, my god! I gosh. seem to recall, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, random placebo-controlled trials for uh, the efficacy of ivermectin, and it doesn't work, right? There have been some small That's ones, um, and they're mixed. Some show and some don't. They're all done differently. There is now one enrolling, an NIH-sponsored trial of many thousand people, which should provide a definitive answer. But okay. uh, many people contend that my aunt took it and she felt great. Right. You know, that's sort of anecdotal stuff. And people think it's a conspiracy. I don't, I don't, I don't get it. All right. So we have a couple of listener picks. We had one up above there from uh, the letter, one of the letters. Uh, Ronald writes, hi, Twift team. Thanks for all you do to make virology accessible. To those of us who never contemplated it when coming up, but are fascinating by it now, we're finally seeing articles that educate the public about the full story of the immune system. This is what you've been preaching for months. The highlight for me being TWIV 736 with Alessandro Sette. I think the comic in this story is great and sends a link to a goats and soda <laughs> a good article. Cartoon, yeah. As an aside, I think science journalism needs to have a navel-gazing moment. Alan, please go kick some butt to understand why it takes them six plus months to use proper terminology, strain versus variant, or more importantly, to tell the full story about a thing, e.g. that initial antibodies are not the only defense, a la B and T cells, or that vaccines are primarily about reducing disease, not infection. Therefore, infection post-vaccine is normal. I'm still looking for a mainstream article about the latter. All the best, Ron is a PhD from the University of Michigan Computer Science. Go blue for Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I get asked about this all the time. People say, well, why can't the mainstream media get it right? And it's hard to explain it, but it's complicated and they don't have a lot of time to figure it out. So, but thank you, Ronald, that's cool. And Agnes writes, hello, I've been an avid TWIV listener for almost two years now. I just wanted to send a link to a series of space shuttle prints, Challenger, Discovery, Atlantis, et cetera, by Kevin Dart that I think might be of interest to both me and Condit and possibly the rest of TWIV's <laughs> team. And they said there's a link for that. Thanks for all you do. P.S. It's currently a hot and sunny 27C in Toronto, Ontario. All right. That's it for TWIV 799. 799. Wow, that went quick. We we entered the pandemic in the 500s, folks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, like five, well, I forget, 580, something like that. Uh, show notes are at microbe.tv slash TWIV. You can send your question or comment to TWIV at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Rich Condit, Emeritus Professor, University of Florida, Gainesville. He's currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. Brian Barker's at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>